which is really just warm up acts. Okay, so three couples, friends since high school, go on holiday together, they rent a house um, up on a mountaintop, beautiful surrounds, crucially no phone reception, but that's kind of relaxing, isn't it? Digital detox. And one night a game of truth or dare goes a smidgy bit too far and they decide to attempt a partner swap. They figure it won't be awkward after the fact because all the lights will be out so no one will really know who anyone else was with or even who they themselves were with. But when the lights come back on, one of the men is dead and their phones still don't work and now the car key is missing and the killer is only just getting started. <laughs> Hopefully, those of you who have already bought the book aren't now already like trying to arrange refunds for it. <laughs> I don't know, this doesn't sound like my kind of thing. I, um, it's, it's thrilling to sort of have such supportive readers, but I do need to tell you that I asked my mother what she thought of the book, and she said, as a book, it was fine. <laughs> oh, I was better than fine, it's terrific. So you've got these three couples up on this mountaintop, six people, and we have six point of, point of view characters. We get inside the minds of each of them. Well, a, a, fr a friend, another crime writer, asked me the other day, how many points of view characters do you think you can have in a book reasonably? And having just done one with three, I said, oh, three or four, you wouldn't want to do more than that. Um, this got nine, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I know because the audiobook has nine narrators, so yeah. yeah. No, we should, I should ask you about that. Okay, t tell us why. Why do you want to take us into the heads, particularly those three couples, the six people up on the mountain? Okay, so I, I like to set challenges for myself. For me, what makes it hard is also what makes it fun. So if I come across an idea for a book that sounds like it would be difficult to write, that makes me want to write it more rather than wanting to write it less. But in this case, and I'm about to do a major spoiler for an obscure point crime novel that came out in 1992. So you, you had your chance, but I read this great book that came out in 1992 um, where there were characters who went on it. They were teenagers and they went on a class trip to an island and then the killer is picking them off one by one and at the end the killer turned out to be the narrator and because I hadn't read any Agatha Christie this blew my tiny little mind that I was like a, a, a kid when I read this I was like surely no one has ever thought of something this brilliant before <laughs> but so with this I went okay maybe I could do that same thing but push it a little bit further what if the killer was the narrator and the reader knew it from the beginning but they didn't know which one I thought that would be an entertaining thing to explore, but the challenge, the real challenge of it, which should have occurred to me earlier, hit me pretty early on in the writing process when I realised I couldn't have any of the characters wonder who the killer was, because then the reader would eliminate that character as a suspect. So I went, okay, well, what the hell else am I going to have them think <laughs> about? Like, what on earth could be so... Uh, psychologically troubling to these people that they're thinking about that instead of trying to identify a killer and that's why I ended up having to delve so deep into their perspectives like right down into their psychological underpinnings because each of them has something going on everyone's hiding something yeah I thought maybe the killer might be a marriage counsellor <laughs> <laughs> no, I am so sick of these people they've, they've all got issues um, so did you start with the plot or the idea or did you start with those characters, those people? No. Okay. It was 2013. I was a much younger man. Let me do some maths. I was 10 years younger. <laughs> and it was like the height of Fifty Shades of Grey fan. Right. Everyone was reading Fifty Shades of Grey and I was like, how do I get in on that? The book sales, not the <laughs> whipping. <laughs> and so I started writing like an outline for a romance novel. Actually, outline is generous. It was really more like a diagram. <laughs> it was like, man A is fixated on women B, <laughs> that kind of thing. And so, but the idea was, let me pitch you this romance novel that doesn't actually exist. Um, the idea was that three couples go away, they swap partners. And, but each of their relationships is in a little bit of trouble, but over the course of the partner swap, 
one of the marriages is rekindled, like they realize how much they actually care about one another because of this experiment. Another one of the marriages falls apart, but one man and one woman make the swap permanent. They realize this was who they were supposed to be with all along. That's kind of a second chance romance type plot line. And the third one, the woman was gonna realize that the man was a dirtbag and she was better off on her own and the man gets booted out. So it was gonna be sort of a happy ending for five of these six characters. But I never got it working because writing romance is hard. <laughs> really, really, really hard. So I kind of shelved this concept and it was only years later that I thought, hey, if one of them was killing the others though, and then I got the tingles, you know, the feeling you get when you're like, I would read that book, but it doesn't exist, so I kind of have to write it. That was, um, so definitely plot before characters, to answer your question. And the characters, it was almost like mapping out a game of Cluedo. I was like, okay, here's my six. I need to come up with six occupations for them to have. I need to come up with six motives for murder. And then I need to even place them in the rooms, like in a game of Cluedo, like West downstairs bedroom, um, upstairs master bedroom and stuff like that. And only then afterwards did the sort of characters really come to life. I mean, the, the, the book reads seamlessly. You're in the story, you're, you're getting carried along as, as you bounce from one perspective to the other. But it's incredibly, if, if you pull back, it's incredibly skillfully done. Do you think you could have written this book 10 years ago? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I couldn't even have written it two years ago, probably. I wrote a book um, last year. My big adult release was a book called Headcase, um, which starred my cannibal detective, um, Timothy Blake. And it had a, a couple of different timelines running through it. There was sort of present day where Timothy Blake was stuck in a mental institution. And there was a couple of weeks earlier when he was investigating the um, the murder, spoilers, the, the death, the suspicious death of an apparent astronaut. And then there was like seven years before that when he was investigating a missing persons case and they all kind of whined together. And that was really difficult, but I think without the process of writing that book, I couldn't have written this one because in that I had three timelines, but I only had one perspective. Whereas this is two timelines split over nine perspectives, so it's a bit more ambitious. But yeah, I wouldn't have had the skill to pull it off. So, the, years ago. so the two timelines. There's one timeline which is these six people, the three couples, up on the mountaintop in a house, and someone dies. Right. The other timeline is like a week later, and it's with a police officer, Chiara, mm -hmm. how pronounce it, and her partner, Elise. Tell us about them. Yeah, so Chiara and Elise, um, some long-term readers may be already familiar with. They, they turned up in a previous book of mine um, called Kill Your Brother. And in that case, so when I had the sort of three couples uh, storyline going, I thought, okay, is this going to be a Timothy Blake mystery or is someone else going to investigate? And, uh, but I'd been really pleased with the response to Kill Your Brother. I was really proud of it. And I thought, well, why don't we bring back that town and bring back some of those characters, um, including Kiara herself. And so, uh, but I needed, I didn't want the present day stuff. And by present day, I mean like one week after you find out at the beginning of the book that by the end of this weekend, two of the men are going to be dead and one of the men, one of the women will be missing, but you don't know which ones. So a week later, Kiara is investigating and so she obviously knows who's dead and who's not, but she sort of hides that from the reader. But I didn't want the present day stuff to feel like filler or padding or stalling, kind of. I, I never wanted the tension to let the tension slip at any point. So that meant I went, okay, well, what if Kiara and Elise go to the same house a week later and what if someone was still there <laughs> without giving too much away? So that means that no matter which timeline you're in, there's always a threat. I always kind of wanted the reader's skin to be crawling. And look, the, the, the plot's great. So all the way through it, you're thinking, you know, who done it, or more like 
what the hell is going on here. <laughs> yeah. It's not well, so much a who done it as a what happened. <laughs> well, both, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. both. But also, there's a kind of, there's emotional depth in this book in that in the, the relationship between Kiara and Elise in the in the present day, the now, is important, and so is the relationships between. Uh, the six people the weekend before. And not just between the husbands and the wives, but um, four of them are all high school friends, right? Yeah. So there's and so there's history there. Yeah. Is was that something you thought, oh this book needs that right from the start, or is that is that something you put in later, or does it just happen? I read this wonderful, wonderful book a couple of years ago called I'm Giving My Marriage a Year by Holly Wainwright. Anybody read that? Yeah, I'm seeing some head nodding and some smiling. Yeah. Amazing, amazing book. And whenever I read a book that I feel like I couldn't have written, I always kind of, uh, I, I go through sort of the stages of grief with it. Like, at first there's the ecstasy of reading a really good book, and then there's, there's this, the despair of, telling myself I could never write like this and then the sort of unqualified ambition of well maybe I could how do I know I haven't tried but with everything I read I try to unpack what I liked most about it and in that particular book it was the fact that I felt like Holly Wainwright had planted cameras not only in my house but in my brain somehow it was it's that feeling of being well they call it feeling singing right you um, you read something and the main character does something or has a thought that you have had but that you've never seen anyone else capture on the page before. And it makes, it's the kind of book that makes you feel a little less lonely as well, I guess, because you're like, oh, okay, I have more in common with my fellow humans than I thought I did because this author who I've never met and they know nothing about me and they're nevertheless capturing this emotion that I've experienced. So in the case of Kill Your Husbands, I knew that I couldn't get the characters to spend much time wondering who the murderer was because that would reveal to the reader that they weren't. So instead I was going to have to delve deep into the, the emotional experiences that they had had um, across time. And so pretty quickly after I started writing this book, by the way, I had a problem. I, um, I went to my wife and said, look, when this comes out, people are going to think this is us. And some of it is. <laughs> so, what do we do about that? And my wife, to her eternal credit, said, just write the book you want to write. The, the books that you write that are good, and my wife doesn't think all my books are good, by the way. She's a trusted first reader because she is willing to, and does, tell me when something's not working. But in this case, she's like, your best books are always the ones that are deeply personal. Speak your truth. We'll, we'll worry about that side of it later. So it meant that I was able to put like a little bit of each of my own experiences into each of the characters. Like there was um, Cole, for example, is a guy who uh, has a problem with male friendship. Um, he is, is intimately acquainted with, if that's not an oxymoron in this case, with the loneliness of male friendship. You sometimes hear trans men talk about this, like the fact that uh, when they identified as female, they would have these very sort of close, open, very sharing relationships with other people. And then when they revealed themselves as, selves as male and started to have male friends, they discovered how walled off these relationships are and how much bluster and competitiveness and sometimes even uh, failed threats are kind of a, a, a crucial aspect of, of male, typical male friendship. So Cole feels incredibly isolated in a way that I have often experienced in the past. But there's nothing more annoying than reading a book where you can tell one of the characters is just the author because you get annoyed with both the character and the author. So in each of these characters, I also had to um, differentiate them not only from one another, which was hard because they had, to, they had to be the same age, they all went to high school together, and they had to have the same body type because they needed to be interchangeable in the dark. But I needed to differentiate them from me as much as possible as well. So I'm like, okay, Cole can be a gym owner. I hate the gym. <laughs> it's like my least favorite place on earth. 
and sort of Oscar has, you know, some of my experiences with postpartum depression and stuff like that. Oscar channels that. And I'm like, Oscar has never picked up a book voluntarily in his life, just hates reading. It's, I don't have to go to this much effort with the female characters, by the way, because if you're a male author, no one ever assumes the female characters are autobiographical. It's just, it's very, very easy to disguise yourself under those circumstances. And how do you manage to, to make them um, at once sympathetic, but also flawed? Because they're, they're all flawed in a way, but you don't want the reader to go, I don't care about that person. Yeah, that's hard because I always kind of have my antenna up for, I write fairly instinctively when I'm writing for adults. I can just go, does this small change feel good or bad? Good, I'll change it, bad, I won't. And sometimes I get it wrong, but the fact that the book is the aggregate of tens of thousands of tiny, tiny changes means overall the manuscript will be better as long as I have better judgment than a coin toss. So, um, but with kids' books, I have to go, would this feel better or worse if I were a kid? And not when I was a kid, because that was back in the 90s. People had different experiences, different tastes. What is an, a modern day 11 year old looking for in a book? And it's quite hard to, for me to have that level of abstraction. So in this case though, oh dear, I've forgotten what the question was. I <laughs> included so many caveats before my answer. Can oh, you remind me? I see you've got notes. <laughs> I, I, I looked, I've forgotten too. But it, it, was about, it was about making the characters simultaneously oh, yes. flawed. And flawed but, and, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the point is, what feels right and doesn't feel right to my antenna is I can look at a book like Kid Your Husbands and go, okay, I made thousands of tiny decisions in the writing of this based on my own tastes, so the book is obviously what I think is a good book. What kind of book is it? It's very violent. I must like violence. In fiction. <laughs> not, not so much in real life. But I think um, I only like violence in fiction under certain circumstances. So there's a reason it's called kill your husbands and not kill your wives, right? Like I don't find violence against women even in fiction, like I don't find it enjoyable. I respect writers' rights to put it in, but it's just not fun for me to read. So there's violence against men for whatever reason it is. And, but crucially there's also stuff like violence against bad people is cathartic in fiction. I sometimes think maybe it's the least violent people in real life who are drawn the most towards violent fiction because it's this sort of wish fulfillment where imagine if the world was that simple. <laughs> imagine if you could just kill your husband or your boss or whatever. Um, but So they needed to be flawed is my point, right? They needed to be flawed in order to make their horrible in ends cathartic but they also needed to be sympathetic because you're going to be trapped in this person's perspective for a while you need to kind of like them so uh, as for your how question i'm not really sure other than that you can make someone more sympathetic by making them suffer for their sins i guess and i don't just mean kind of the sticky endings that they come to but oscar for example is a in some ways a profoundly unlikable character, although there seems to be a gender split on how people interpret Oscar. I would be very interested in the, the feedback from everyone in this room on him. But the fact that, yes... So, so what's the gender split? Ah, uh, well, men seem to be more sympathetic to that character than women are, I think. But and again, it's a huge generalisation, so I'm, I'm open to be sort of being proved wrong. But I think... The fact that he is kind of making his wife's life miserable makes him pretty unsympathetic. But the fact that he is also miserable makes him more sympathetic. So I guess the amount to which you forgive Oscar or don't depends on how much you identify with him. And I, I got an email from my copy editor, no, structural editor, early on when it was quite a, um, a, a sort of the email was, you know, praising this thing, she said, that at several times in the manuscript I paused to marvel at what a truly unsympathetic character Oscar is. Honestly, I might have been taken in by him in real life, but in fiction, because I'm privy to the constant whining and self-pity of his inner monologue, um, and I'm like, oh, I just won't 
tell that lady how autobiographical that character is. <laughs> hugely humiliating for me. But that's the wonderful thing about fiction, isn't it? I would never dare write a memoir with any of this stuff in it. I've never killed anyone, I've never done a partner swap. I need to be explicit about the bits that are purely my imagination. Okay, before this he said, is it okay if we live stream this on Instagram? <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. Hi Instagram. <laughs> I am Oscar. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to do too much to worry about that. Now, this setup, you've got this, you know early on, let me just take you through the, um, there's these two time periods, right? So there's, say, last Friday and then you'll get not necessarily the perspectives from each of the six, but two or three or one or whatever. Wait, Chris's new book is much more ambitious than this, by the way. His three perspectives go all the way back to like World War One and the 90s and present day right now. It's incredible to me that you're making such a big deal out of one week. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this is the pattern. There's an, there's an epilogue that's maybe a month ago, which does, of course, end up explaining something. Then it goes, last Friday now, last Friday now, last Saturday now, last Saturday now, last Saturday now, last Sunday now, oh, last Saturday, last Sunday. Oh yeah, there's a quick back and forth. Last Sunday now, two hours earlier now, last Sunday now, um, and, and the epilogue, sorry, I meant prologue before. Um, that's pretty complex. Yes. So that was took a lot of nutting out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and the point of it is, I need to bear in mind. So we are now all living in a world where ChatGPT exists, right? That and things like it. And so um, leaving aside, you know, the the ethics, the technology, all that stuff. I am someone who has always been pretty focused on what I'm competing with. So early in my career, I was like, okay, I'm competing with film and TV. What are film and TV good at? They're very good at showing what things look like. So I will not bother putting much visual description in my books anymore because the TV does it better. What is the TV bad? Well, describing how things feel and how they smell and how they taste, I'll put a lot more of that into my fiction. Uh, the TV doesn't do similes. You know, the, the Road by Cormac McCarthy will the book will have the soft black tout blew through the streets like squid ink uncoiling along the ocean floor and the scavengers trod silky holes which closed behind them as silently as eyes and the movie is just people walking through the dust. So I started including you know, more of that kind of stuff in my fiction. Now that I'm competing with ChatGPT, I'm like, well, what's it good at? It can do quantity. <laughs> um, so my old strategy of like pumping out books as fast as I can probably doesn't have a lot of longevity. Um, what is it bad at? Well, it's bad at borrowing from its own life experience because it doesn't have any. And it's bad at originality because it's kind of just absorbing all these stolen novels, right? So, uh, but the, the crucial thing is that it's bad at is bearing in mind what the reader thinks or is thinking at any given time. So, because it doesn't know. It's, it just knows what the next word is statistically likely to be. It doesn't know what the reader is thinking. It's not, I'm not ruling out that some version of that, but, but the way the technology exists at the moment, that's not gonna work. So in the case of the jumping around timelines, I was always bearing in mind, okay, what does, what does the character think is happening? What does the reader think is happening? And what is actually happening? And then kind of playing with those perceptions. So. I like to make sure that just when I've made the reader suspect a given thing, we sort of reveal it and they go, aha, and then you jump back and start planting clues for the next thing. I, I don't think there's room in the sort of modern environment for a book that has a big twist at the end. You want to give people that big twist feeling every chapter if you can. So the jumping around of timelines was just tightly controlling what information the reader had and sometimes that meant jumping back and forth. And, and so there are a few good cliffhangers, you know, in whatever time frame you're in and then suddenly you're back in the other time, time frame and you go, oh, quick, I've got, got to get through this, but, you know, that's... Yeah. So if I would chat GPT yeah. and I was doing this and the scenario was six people in a house 
on a lonely mountain. And we know right from early on, this is no spoiler, that what, there's two dead and one missing, right? Yeah. So, that, so we know that. So if I was ChatGPT, I would be writing a slasher movie. You know, the ones where you go, do not separate, and the person that goes by off by themselves. So there is a kind of, you are playing with that trope, but one thing that saves it, there's a few things that save it. One is just the humanity of the characters. Two is, is the sophistication of the plot, because it's, it's not just you know, a monster in the woods. But the other thing is humour, and I think this is very much you know, Jack Heath's trademark. How and why do you use humour in your books? Um, I think, so when I wrote Hangman, which is the first of my um, cannibal FBI consultant novels, mm -hmm. um, the first draft, I couldn't get, so I spent 10 years working on that book and trying to find a publisher for it, and one of the problems with the early drafts was that it wasn't just that they were gruesome, it was that they were monotonous. Like everyone, readers kept telling me it was too gruesome. And so I kept trying to tone down the gore, but then it was just kind of dull. I eventually realized that it, it wasn't the gore that was the problem, it was the monotony. So I kind of rewrote it to, firstly I gave, uh, I, I gave it a sort of arc, so it kind of starts off not very gruesome and then builds to a particular scene in a basement but the other thing was that I gave Timothy Blake a sense of humour um, and the fact that he would sort of make a little wisecrack often just a mental one uh, in any given moment in head case I think he walks into a lift with like three other people and as soon as the doors close he's already wondering um, how long, if the lift gets stuck, how long he should wait before suggesting they draw straws. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like his immediate thought as soon as he walks into a lift. And so that gave me the opportunity to take what would be a boring scene, man walks into lift, and make it a funny scene. So in Kill Your Husbands it was a bit harder, right? Because, uh, don't take this out of context, but cannibalism is inherently funnier. <laughs> <laughs> than, than a marriage falling apart, right? So um, it helped that one of the characters in the book is a stand-up comic. I appear to have alienated my sister-in-law and one of my other friends. Every, no one from the stand-up comedy community will ever talk to me again after this. How, how was your lodge the other night with Benjamin Stevens? <laughs> it was Crime good. writer and stand-up comedian. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was great, actually. He's, he's very, very good value. Not the, um, his new book, Everyone in This Train is a Suspect, is amazing. Uh, but yeah, I should have... He was like, you didn't ask me to proofread the stand-up comedy stuff. And I said, was it not funny? <laughs> and he's like, it was pretty funny. <laughs> so that, that was all right. But I think, so firstly, having a comic relief character helps. But I also think that um, when I'm writing my first draft, if it occurs to me to put something in, I put it in. I don't second guess myself and wonder if I'm painting myself into a corner. I just put it in. And I tell myself, if it turns out that that leads to a blind alley, I'll take it out in the end. And then when I'm editing, if it occurs to me to take something out, I do. And if it occurs to me to put something more in, I do. I, I don't overthink any of these decisions. Like I said, it's just, I only have to be better than the coin toss and in the aggregate, the novel will become good. And so here's the thing though, every time it occurred to me to make a joke in this book, I made the joke thinking I would take it out later if it didn't work. Pretty much every joke stayed in, I think. I think uh, one of the things I've learned from public speaking, like I do a lot of talks at primary schools and stuff like that, and talking at primary schools is it's way harder talking to kids than adults because adults are very good at pretending to listen, as you're <laughs> demonstrating right now. Um, kids, if they're not talking amongst themselves, you know you've got them, right? But I learned pretty quickly that public speaking, whether it's to kids or adults, if you're funny, then that is you rewarding the audience for their attention. And if you don't reward them for their attention on a very regular basis, basis you're going to lose it. So laughing is fun. If I can make the reader laugh, they'll keep turning the pages and they'll absorb the plot. So that's why it's important. As for how I do it, I don't know. I just, if a joke occurs to me, I put it in. Okay, we're, we're getting near the end. We'll have some time for some questions, okay? So just have a thing. I'll, I'll ask one more. Yeah. 
there is there is a bit at, at the moment uh, cosy crime books are rich for Richard Osman sort of type books, but it's also the kind of the more amusing self-referential meta fiction fiction. Uh, Benjamin Stevenson's books. Solari Gentil. Solari Gentil. The yeah. Women in the Library. There is a bit of a movement there. Do you see yourself in some ways fitting? Because there are a couple of sort of meta references here, and you are playing with some tropes. You know, the the, the people getting picked off on the mountaintops. You know, the old spooky. Well, it's not so old, but yeah. it's a bit spooky. Do you, do you think you fitting in there, or is it? Um. I don't know. I think so. I, I have like a, a meta crime novel in the bottom drawer that I uh, like talk about while I'm on Instagram Live, but I I don't see this book as sort of fitting into that vein because I think to write a, one of those really really good meta crime books, you've got to be just not just a thinker but also an overthinker. Right, you've got to be sort of second guessing or even third guessing the reader at every turn. And Benjamin's a great example of a reader, of a writer rather, who is constantly sort of daring the reader to second guessing. Like in the first chapter of Everyone on This Train is a Suspect, it mentions um, a body found wearing a blue scarf. And then in the first chapter, the main character's agent is wearing a blue scarf, which she then passes on to another character. And a chapter later, they give it to another character. So he's kind of messing with the reader by going like, hey, that scarf that I explicitly told you was a clue, just watch it move from person to person to person. It's like he's playing three card Monty for the audience's amusement. I, I am not that sort of reader myself. I don't try to predict where a story is going when I'm reading. I just let it wash over me. Um, so I'm thrilled when that kind of reader still enjoys my work, and they seem to, but given that that's not the kind of reader myself, that's not where I see myself fitting. All I don't just want to give the reader a puzzle to solve, I want to put on a show for them. That's what I'm always trying to do, make it fun. So what sort of reader are you? Someone who likes that? Um, yeah, it's probably telling that mostly these days I read rom-coms, the main reason being, I think, uh, well, firstly, I used to be really into horror movies and then my children were born and after that, you know, you get to a point where your life has enough stress in it. You're like, <laughs> why would I add additional unnecessary fear to my evening routine? So I started watching more comedies. But in the case of this stuff, I mean, when I'm reading someone else's crime novel, even if it's a really good one, like one of Solari's or one of yours or something, I'm enjoying it in a different way. I'm going, ooh, that's clever. I might not have thought of that if that was, if this was my book. So reading it feels like work. Whereas when I'm reading something I have no idea how to write, like a rom-com, I can just kind of absorb myself into the story and, and get that kind of self-oblivion flow state that I really love from reading. So that's the kind of reader I am. The, that kind of. And what about true crime? Because there are crime writers, like crime fiction writers, who are very attentive to true crime podcasts and whatever, because they get ideas. What about you? Yeah, I don't. Um, uh, I don't enjoy true crime as much as I enjoy crime fiction. Partly because it feels bad to enjoy it. Like these are real people who really suffered and really died. Whereas. Um, uh, fiction isn't just a guilty pleasure, it's a pleasure. So I'm not judging anyone else who, who writes it, but I've certainly caught myself um, reading and watching true crime and sometimes I think my writing is an excuse rather than the reason. Like I go, oh, I should watch this thing for book research when really I just have a morbid sort of curiosity. <laughs> so I, um, I try to keep an eye on myself for that. but. Ultimately, um, as far as sort of making the crimes authentic and stuff goes, I just write from my imagination and then I find experts. I, I have a friend who's a police officer, I have another friend who's a, uh, who's a lawyer, and I have someone else who knows about computers. I got talking to Dr. Richard Harris a while ago from Made Famous by the Thai Cave Rescue because he helped me write a, a scene in a hyperbaric chamber in one of my books. 
And um, so whenever someone tells me they do something interesting for a, for a living, I always take notes so they can pester them with questions after. But yeah, it doesn't come from my true crime reading. It mostly comes from the people I've met. Because again, I don't want to write the same stuff into my books as everyone else who read that that true crime book or everyone watched Making a Murderer so if I watch it in the course of my research I'll end up just kind of borrowing details from Making a Murder. I always try to borrow from life even if it's not my own. Okay, before we go to questions, yeah. is there any particular point you want to make about this book or in general or where you see yourself now as a writer? Um, the... Not especially, other than, so I'm extremely grateful for the, the there are uh, moments sort of early in my career in particular where I had a tendency towards professional envy. And this is not unique to writers, you know, the, you, um, uh, wherever you are, whatever totem pole you're on, there's always someone above you and sometimes it's tempting to focus on the people above rather than the people below, which means you get sort of unhappy and bitter. And, but maybe it's a good thing. If you focus on the people below, then you start to become condescending and, and self-aggrandizing and stuff, and that's not good either. But I had an experience a, um, a little while ago where there was a, an author I really looked up to who, um, uh, he was very successful, he wrote full-time, and he was always full of advice that didn't sound quite right, but he was so successful that, that I hung on his every word. And later it turned out he was just a huge liar. <laughs> so he um, is... What well, he... deliberately sending you astray? Um, no, I don't think so. It was just that... So yes, he was a full-time writer, but that was because he'd inherited millions of dollars from... Um, so, so he was sort of this self-funded... Writing was kind of this hobby that he could pursue. But he would also like claim to have dinner with people that it turned out he'd never met, stuff like that. I don't think it was strategic, maybe it was compulsive or something. But I've stopped comparing myself to other writers in that sense and instead realised from the honest conversations that I've had with others that there are so few, so few people who can even make a living doing this job. Right? It's, and the reason that they're even more rare than you think they are is because there's this kind of fake it till you make it mentality. So I guess the only, where do I see myself as a writer? <coughs> Very lucky is where I see myself as a writer. I hope to be able to keep doing this forever. I don't want to retire. I, um, I love my job. Before we get into the audience questions, because otherwise I'll forget to do this, can we all just thank the wonderful Chris Hammer for... <laughs> Chris Hammer books make marvellous Christmas presents. <laughs> and on that note, let's thank Andrew for coming to the book club. <laughs> Andrew used to be my boss when I worked at Dimmicks. He was a great boss, I assume he still is. And can I also thank my wonderful wife in the front row for everything she's done for me. I am the worst person to live with in December when I have like a book coming out but I'm constantly like twitching with anxiety over doing things like this but um, I, I couldn't do this without your support babe you're amazing so we will cut the cake in a second I see hungry looking people but first are there any questions everyone wants the cake <laughs> so I want to know why you find romance hard to write ah oh, well um, a few different reasons one is that, so romance novels, not always, but there's a particular trope that's very common where it's like alternating perspectives, right? You get his perspective, you get her perspective. This is in a sort of, you know, heterosexual romance. And I can obviously do that in this, but there was um, uh, probably, early readers have told me that the, mo that the only relationship in this book they found heartwarming is the, um, the police officer and her girlfriend, right? That they, and I think that's one of the reasons it was important to include it was because otherwise this might be a pretty dark sort of cynical seeming book, but having one relationship that isn't perfect, but is at least, you know, heartfelt and, and beautiful um, really means that I don't need to leave the reader with a bad taste in their mouth at the end kind of. But the thing is, um, because they are both women, so I'm not part of the queer community and I'm not the right person to be telling queer stories, but I do, do know what it's like to be in love with a woman. I have no idea what it's like to be in love with a man. I can't picture it. So whenever I'm writing from, the female, from a straight female perspective, I'm always like, he had 
big shoulders <laughs> and like veiny hands. I think women like that. <laughs> it's like really hard. And obviously what like what a queer person sees in her partner might not be the same thing that a straight man is attracted to in, in a woman, but it, it's not quite as much of a leap of consciousness. So one of the things that's difficult about writing romance for me is I guess it's hard to imagine selling a romance book that didn't have a female perspective in it, and I would then have to write that and try to work out what on earth it is you see in us. <laughs> um, I'm only just now noticing the, the distinct lack of men in the audience. <laughs> um, the, uh, I can't think of any other reasons it would be hard other than it's my same kind of... Uh, I'm envious of any writer who can make something exciting where no one's life is at stake. Like, um, I mean, in, I guess in romance fiction, your life is at stake, but your death isn't, kind of. Maybe that's a better way of putting it, but yeah. It always feels to me really gutsy to write a scene where no one gets killed and still rely on the reader to be on the edge of their seat. I'm not convinced that I've got it yet. Another question, please. You've Netflix does give you a call. Yeah. And they want this book on the screen. Have you got a cast in mind, and would you be playing off? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, so I did get a um, uh, a contract in my inbox today. It's uh, don't don't hold your breath. It's just a shopping agreement. There's every chance that this this thing will never get made. But my intention is to tell them, okay, just take the cast from the audiobook, but make a couple of switcheroos. I want Kiara to be played by Zinzi Okenyo, and I want. Uh, Elise to be played by Hannah Monson as she is in the audiobook of Kill Your Brother but not in the audiobook of Kill Your Husbands. And I want Jessica Bell, who is, a, who is Kiara in uh, Kill Your Husbands, to be Stephanie from Kill Your Brother. So yeah, there's a whole cast list. It's all there in my head. But the thing is, I'm doing it just based on their voices. I don't even really know what they look like. I, I want to ask about that, the, the audio book, because typically when, when, a, when a novel is turned into an audio book, there's one narrator. Because it's cheaper, I think, for the audio company yeah. to do it. And the actors who do it are just spectacular. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the descriptive passages, it's the dialogue. You know, old man, young girl, middle-aged woman, you know, derelict bloke, etc., etc. But your book, yeah, each character has a different actor. How did that happen? That's that's really quite unusual. So with with print book publishing, I'm a small cog in a large machine. With audiobook publishing, I'm an even smaller cog in an even larger machine. So to an extent, this process is opaque to me. Um, uh, so they didn't say, what do you think of this cast list? They said, we've secured great news, we've secured these nine actors. And I was like, okay, great, amazing, <laughs> so, cool. So your other books are audio books, but with one narrator. But with one narrator, yeah, yeah. In this case, so I don't know why they split it nine ways, but I'm very, very glad they did. But I'm also glad they didn't do it like a radio play, because they could have. They could have done like a radio play with each, um, every line of dialogue is done by the actor. But the thing is, you're not supposed to know who's who half the time, yes. so that wouldn't have worked. But it was handy that all the actors knew one another because they're all in like the Sydney acting community. So they were able to kind of do plausible impressions of one another in the um, in their scenes. So it's funny casting an audiobook because when you're casting a narrator, you're not just casting one character, you're casting all the characters. So finding nine different actors who could do all nine different characters was quite an accomplishment. I'm glad I wasn't the one who had to organise it, however they did it. Wow. Um, another question. I think everyone wants to get to the cake, Chris. Should we let them get let, the cake? Okay, let them eat cake. Okay. <laughs> oh, I forgot to say hammer time when you were about to start talking. Every time we do an event together, I'm like, remember to say hammer time, Jack. You'll have to write another book. I will. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris. Right, thank you, everybody. Um, Chris and I will be signing books at those tables up the back. We are happy to write, you know, Merry Christmas or Dear eBay, whatever you prefer. <laughs> um, the books are for sale over there. Um, and the cake is for everyone, and there's probably still some money left on the bar tab. Okay, thank you all for coming, everyone. <laughs>
how on earth do I do this?